um, breaking big hockey stories and having one of the most successful podcasts in mm. the sports world. That's what Jeff Merrick does best. And he joins wow. us. Oh, welcome in, Jeff. Uh, you read that just as I wrote it. Well done, Tyler. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the execution, 100%. Uh, you, we're going to start with like an icebreaker question and before okay, we get sure. into the hockey stuff. Okay. Uh, you're a bit of a hockey historian. Yeah. Hypothetical. I have a time okay. machine for you. You can use it once. You can either go oh, back and watch a game okay. 100 years in the past, or you can jump forward and watch an NHL game 100 years from now. Which one do you pick, the future or the past? Uh, I want to go past because I like being surprised. So I don't want to know, like, I'm one of these people that doesn't want to know what's going to happen in the future and doesn't really think about it a lot because, and maybe this is just a byproduct of getting older, but I like surprises. I liked them when I was a kid and I like them even as I get older now, but so I don't know what's going to happen in the future because I really do like surprises, but I am really curious about going back to the past. There's a, like, I'll even drill it down for you even, even, even more. Um, I, I know the exact game that I want to watch okay. and there's two of them. And it's the World Championships in 1969. It is Czechoslovakia versus the Soviet Union. And this is after the Prague Spring. And this is the most, I think, the most heated, two most heated hockey games ever. Because let's not forget, this is after the Soviet Union has crushed the Prague Spring. This is why Yarmur Yager wore number 68, right? His grandfather perished as well. And that's when the tanks marched into the cobblestone streets. And this was all about, you know, we, we hear so much about metaphors in hockey and metaphors in sports. Well, they're just metaphors. But everything, those Czechoslovakian players, including players like, you know, uh, Bobby Holik's father, uh, Vaslav Nedimansky, Yuri Holchik, all these types of guys, like everything they said they wanted to do to the Soviets, they did. Like that's what that's what they, exactly what they meant. Like it was win these games or perish. It was win or die for these players. To me, it was the hottest hockey games ever played. It happened in Stockholm, 1969, World Championships, and Czechoslovakia won twice. And those to me were probably the most emotionally charged hockey games ever played and i know that covers a lot of territory but how about that tyler i'll drill down specifically to the game that i want to to two games that i want to go and watch those videos are on youtube by the way of those games like they are hot games like chirping like standing over a net miner and beaking them pushing the net off the moorings like these games were these games were intense Damn, that's a hell of an answer. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, send show. me back to a game in like the 40s so I could have a cigarette. But that shows you the difference <laughs> intellectually. Uh, the Edmonton Oilers, speaking of smoking, they are smoking hot right now, Jeff. Seven in oh, a row. nice. Around. Our YouTube yeah. chat's fired up. They're feeling good. Did you see this turnaround coming this quickly for the Oilers when they were really down in the shits? You know, we all wondered what would happen when Connor McDavid was going to get healthy. And we all wondered when Matias Ekholm was going to get healthy. Did we did we think that, you know, us geniuses, did we all think that it was going to happen this suddenly and it was going to be so overwhelming? Like, the, the, the Oilers are mowing into teams like hogs into truffles. Like, it's not a matter of are they going to win, it's how much are they going to win by. Like, and and you really see, like, if there's if there's any doubt about Connor McDavid's position in hockey, and how head and shoulders he is above everybody else. Like I've, I've said this before about McDavid. Um, I used to say this when he played in, in junior in Erie. It's like McDavid, every time McDavid's out there, he's saying to the rest of the world, this is how we play hockey on the planet that I come from. <laughs> we'll just let you people here just sort of catch up. But if there's any if there's any doubt, like who the most valuable player in this league is to his team, like it's stop the fights. Like the, 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 the fight's over. What McDavid has, has done here, you know, has, has been remarkable. All he had to do was get healthy. Now, here's a question I'll throw out to you guys. Do you believe the Jersey Tuck conspiracy theory? I don't even know what that what is, is, so I'd like you to explain it to me. Okay. I'm glad we got here. Okay. So while Connor McDavid was injured, all of a sudden, we saw Connor McDavid not tucking his jersey. The jersey was out. So the theory was that perhaps he was wearing some protection under the jersey to protect his injury. And all of a sudden, as Connor McDavid got healthy and started to attach a rocket to his back, the jersey was tucked again, and the injury was over. 
Elliot and I have talked about this a couple of different times. Do you believe in the Jersey tuck conspiracy that it was untucked because he had padding to protect the injury? I do believe that. I know. <laughs> totally believe that. We I'm should be paying. Sucker. We should be paying closer attention to the team we cover as well. I'm a sucker for a good conspiracy theory. Me though. too. I'm in on yeah. that. I mean, we had Frank on the show last week, and he said there's people around the organization around McDavid who's, who think he was as low as 50 percent mm -hmm. at some time. So, I mean, it would make yeah. sense if he was wearing some sort of protective gear. I also was someone who thought they should have let him play in the Heritage Classic. Just you know, sure, he really wants to. And they probably should have just sat him down again after that. But you mentioned, Jeff, like undeniably the MVP or however you worded it. I think he's yeah. undeniably the MVP because there is there any better case than when he was not at 100 percent and wasn't producing the team stunk and then he got healthy and started producing. And now they've won seven games in a row. Like that's the clearest cut MVP case ever. Personally, I would have said before the Heritage Classic, I would have sent him to Lourdes to bathe in holy water. Uh, to heal himself up perfectly, you know, I don't know, get get blessed somehow with holy water and then send him back to uh, to the Heritage Classic. But no, you're right. Like it's it's night and day. And but the thing is, like, and when when Connor goes, like everybody comes along. We always talk about, oh, drags him into the fight. Like that's the cliche. Or, oh, drags him into the fight. Drags him into the fight. Connor McDavid goes. You know how like when there's a there's a bullet, there's that vacuum that exists right behind the bullet. Like that's how Connor drags everybody. Like so many of these players on this Oilers team are that vacuum right behind the bullet. Everyone just sort of comes along for the ride. And that to me is like, I don't know, like one of the marks of greatness. Like here we are. Like I always feel weird. Like honestly, guys, like when I, when I talk about Connor McDavid, I always feel like I'm one step away from saying, and he invented oxygen. So I always <laughs> got to try to like catch myself, right? Start going on about Connor McDavid. Yeah, that's, that's something I always hammer on the show, on the pods, mm. is like, to Oilers fans, it's year, whatever, we're in now, eight, nine. It, it, sometimes you get a little numb to it. It's like, ah, oh, Connor doing Connor stuff. Like, even that goal he scored against the Wild is just like an insane display does. of the edge work, the vision, everything he does. Don't take it for granted. Because yeah. this is a, once in a generation, doesn't even really sum it up. Like, the stuff he does with so much consistency is just yeah. remarkable. You know what? That that's a really good point. Um, uh, in one of the interviews that uh, Elliot and I did with Jay Woodcroft, this would have been, I think, it was last year's, and we asked about that, like the uh, the idea that like you're seeing this game in and game out. Like at a certain point, you sort of take things for granted. And Woodcroft brought up a great point. He said, "Look, we have to we have to always remember here. Don't become numb to this. Don't become numb to what you're seeing and just expect. Like I'll, I'll give you an example. Like uh, I don't know if you guys are pro wrestling fans, but the first main event match." that I ever saw as a kid would have been, I don't know, 1982. And the main event was Ric Flair versus Ricky Steamboat. And I went with my dad, it was at Maple Leaf Gardens. And I remember, it was a great match. And I remember leaving and going like, wow, this must be what all wrestling's like. Not realizing I had probably seen the best match or the best two, you know, it's arguable, but two of the, two of the, the, the best athletes in professional wrestling at the, the height of their of their powers and their greatness competing in front of me. You know, I thought that all wrestling must be like this. Like if I always think about this, if I'm a young Edmonton Oilers fan growing up right now and I see Connor McDavid, I'm thinking that all of hockey is awesome and all of hockey is like this because I don't have context yet. Because I'm just growing up. Like I grew up in Toronto watching Daryl Sittler and watching Buffalo Sabres games and seeing the French connection. That's what I thought hockey was like. If I'm a young Oilers fan right now, I am probably numb to it and just think that like, oh yeah, like that's just Connor McDavid. Like this is how hockey is played. But I think Woodcroft is bang on. Don't be numb to this. Like you're seeing something really, really special here on a consistent game in game out basis. My formative hockey years were during the decade of darkness. Well, both of mm, us, because yes. we're basically the same age. So you can imagine when the Oilers start terribly, I'm kind of like, ah, this feels, feels like we're right back at home here. There's a comfort <laughs> in the Oilers. <laughs> being of it, yeah. uh, I got a question about the, the new coaching staff for you, Jeff. Like, Paul, sure. Paul Coffey is now on this Ooh. team. And yeah. coming in, everyone was unsure, right? Because he's literally... <laughs> Yeah, Daryl Case is a system. Yeah, team. more or less. Like that's and, what it felt like. And now he's just he has changed this entire blue line. I guess are you surprised at where this blue line is at right now with with coffee? Or do you think we should have given him more appreciation for who he actually is? Yeah, it's a good question, Ed. You know, the, the one thing that I wondered about with Paul Coffee, honestly, and 
this has kind of been you know, historically, this is a thing in the NHL. I mean, Wayne Gretzky didn't last very long behind the bench with the Coyotes. Uh, Rocket Richard lasted, I think it was two games with Quebec when he got behind the bench. Like the greatest players do not make the greatest coaches mm. because the greatest players just assume that everyone that they're coaching can do the things that they did automatically. Now, great coaching is a matter of, you know, being able to transmit information from your brain to their feet or to their hands. And I always wondered that about Coffee um, behind the bench here. You know, he was such a sublime player, like one of the greatest defensemen to ever play the game. What a sublime skater. His instincts are were better than just about anybody else that he played with um, uh, when he was in the, in the NHL, regardless of whatever team he was on. Um, great players don't make great coaches. My concern, and we'll see how this plays out over the course of the season. First of all, his instincts are offensive. So right away, it's the jump or the cheat or whatever, because that's what made Paul Coffey successful. Does he have that style of defenseman on this team who can be successful playing that same style? I, I still don't think we have enough runway here. But the only thing that I wondered about was, would someone who was as great as Coffey was a defenseman be able to transmit that information or be an effective coach? Because the history of hockey says no. Like the greatest players do not make the greatest coaches. They they just flat out don't. So uh, I, I'm not going to pass judgment yet on Coffey and, and how he's handled the blue line to say I can't pass judgment on Knobloch here and, and how he's handled the Oilers. Um, I don't think we've, we've seen enough runway. But then again, like I'm one of the people that still says that, you know, I don't think that Woodcroft should have been fired until Connor, until we saw like a healthy Connor McDavid. So... I don't know. I'm I'm not willing to to pass judgment on any of it yet. Those, but that was that was the one question that I have and had, and I suppose still have about Paul Coffey behind the bench. Great player, but great players don't always make great coaches. Quite the opposite, as a matter of fact. On that note about the great players not being great coaches, I know Low Tide always told this great story. I think it was Ted Williams when he went to go be a coach with like the Red Sox or whatever, whoever it was, and yeah. the, a player couldn't hit the curveball right, and yeah. he just goes. Well, just watch the seams. You can see the seams. <laughs> you can't see the seams. What are you talking about? And like, that's why we joke. Like, what's Paul Coffey going to do? Tell Cody CC to skate faster? Like, he can't. Like, that's who Cody CC is. Um, yeah. But it's interesting to kind of see. Like, you mentioned Wayne Gretzky, Maurice Richard. But there has been this kind of not a rush, but it's happened a few times now. Where like Marty St. Louis jumped right into the NHL and has been good. Rod Brindamore kind of just jumped right into the NHL and was yep. good. Maybe it's something about the way players now are coached at almost a professional level from when they're 11 or 12, mm -hmm. sometimes even earlier. But like these guys are coming in now and just being motivators. And, and that seems to be working. Like these former players are making the jump at a level that they never really did before. Yeah. It, it is interesting too, because, and I think we're always, you know, skeptical of those coaches like, well, hang on a second here. You didn't spend, you know, uh, three years in Norfolk and then two years in, in Wilkes-Barre. And uh, I don't, I don't see you on any Hershey bears uh, uh, game, game sheet here. Like what, what's going on? How are you going to coach in the, in the national hockey league? I think what it sort of winks at really more than anything else, guys, is there's no like one specific way or one specific person. Um, uh, there's not one specific way to get to the NHL. Uh, do some have doors open for them? Yeah, of course, just based on who they are. Um, do others have to, you know, bang it out in the minors for a long time and, and wait their time? Like, look, look at how long it took Bruce Boudreau to get to the NHL. And then it took, you know, the Washington Capitals finally grew frustrated at Glenn Hanlon and they didn't want to hire another coach. And they already had Bruce Boudreau under contract in Hershey. And next thing you know, Gabby's up there and they're winning hockey games. And now everyone's saying, well, we don't have to pay coaches. We can just get our American hockey league guy to do this. And that opened the door for the Dan Bilesma and everybody else of the, of the NHL. And it, it very much became a trend. Um, much like there's not one way to win the Stanley cup, much like there's not one way to win a hockey game. I don't think that there's one way to get to the NHL. And I think, you know, historically it doesn't play well for the superstars to go behind the bench, but the two examples that you brought up are, are exceptional. Like the, and the interesting thing about Brindamore is like, it's funny. I was thinking about him on the weekend. I'm, I'm glad you brought him up. Edmonton stumbles out of the gate. It costs Jay Woodcroft his job. Minnesota stumbles out of the gate. It costs Dean Evison his job. Carolina is in a bad way right now. Like there's closed door meetings with the players. We've seen Rod Brindamore rip the team to Darren Pang on the bench. We're going to lose 50 to nothing. 
<laughs> we've seen him, you know, talk about how, you know, there's not enough guys that are working hard and pulling their way. Like he's gone to that well here. Normally in a situation like this, we'd be saying, uh, maybe the guys have tuned Brendamore out. But do you get the feeling for one second that anyone in Carolina is talking about the coach here? Not no. a chance. No. Not, a, not a chance. Um, they're talking about the goaltending and needing another scorer. And all of a sudden, that's on Don Waddell's Christmas list for Santa now. <laughs> but not for a second are they talking about, well, you know what? Maybe they've tuned out Rod the Bod. It's not even a, not even a question. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I had the take last week, too, and I know we debated this. I said, the Oilers over this stretch are not showing us anything they've never shown us before. This is basically looking like the same Oilers team that dominated down the stretch last year. McDavid scoring, they're getting saves, and their special teams is absolutely on fire. They, I stand by they could have done this under Jay Woodcroft. We've seen them look like a cup contender under Jay Woodcroft. It's not I'm with you. magically doing it. It's now with a coach who I think is pretty similar to Jay Woodcroft, all things considered. So um, I stand by that. My last one for you, we'll wrap up with another Oilers question. Um, sure. I'm kind of stealing this from you. It came from us in our show prep of what the Oilers need to do still. Oh, yeah. um, this team looks good. It looks like you mentioned many ways to win a Stanley Cup. Teams will do it yep. with goaltending. Teams will do it sometimes with just what seems like sheer luck over the course of a playoff run. How close is this Oilers team? Do you think they need to add anything before the end of the season? Is there one area that you go, they're clearly not good enough there? I would still look at goaltending. I still I, I, I still would. I would still look at goaltending, and I would still look at at least one more defenseman. Like, he, here's the thing. Like I said, like, like there isn't just one way to win the Stanley Cup, but it seems as if, and whether you look at the Vegas Golden Knights or the Avalanche or the Tampa Bay Lightning, yeah. like, look at all the recent St. Louis Blues were a good example as well. It seems as if you have to have one of two things. You can either have great goaltending, or a great blue line. It doesn't seem like you have to have both, but you have to have one or the other. Like, all due respect to Aiden Hill. Last year, defensively, that was about that back end and those pterodactyls that Vegas had. And they had the same thing with the, the, the St. Louis Blues. Um, with the Tampa Bay Lightning, they had the luxury of kind of having both. Like, they had Andre Vasilevsky and a murderer's row of blue liners. Right. But it seems as if if you're going to be successful, you need to have one or the other. Like, I think Edmonton is fine up front. I really do. Like, you can quibble about the bottom six. I get, I get it. Um, but if I'm Ken Holland, I'm still looking in net and I'm still looking for one more defenseman. 2024 Dwayne Rollison. Am I right, Liam? Uh, all right, Jeff. <laughs> a long time. Almost hang 20 on. Minutes. Hang on. I, I miss Dwayne Rollison. You know why I miss Dwayne Rollison? I miss Dwayne Rollison because I love goaltenders that defend their crease physically. I have all day for Dwayne Rollison. I wish there were more goalies that were like that now. Like, I understand, like, a lot of goalies, they try to drop penalty and flop and all that. Rollison was right there fighting for every piece of ice. I have all day for Dwayne Rollison. Thank you for bringing up his name because it always makes me smile, too. <laughs> This, like was, this was a great conversation. This yeah. was so much fun. Jeff, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. No problem. Anytime. See ya. There you go. Star Mechanical Guest Line Hall of Fame kind of chat. That yes. was great. Jeff was a lot of fun. Uh What's up, Nation Citizens? If you like that video, then you need to be subscribed to the Oilers Nation YouTube. Podcasts, live shows, exclusive interviews and analysis, everything you need from your favorite voices at Oilers Nation. And you don't want to miss any of it, so hammer that subscribe button.